Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. Bodies in Bandera County. Tonight we take a look at a string of missing persons cases that have been building since April. How it's impacted the daily routine for residents there. Also, the weekend is highlighting a struggle between businesses and their neighbors. The issue here, loud music. A new proposal could help neighbors sleep easier, how it could have a bigger impact on business owners. But first. A community on edge tonight. The concern coming after a string of people reported missing since April. Three bodies have been found so far in Bandera County. A fourth person, though, still missing. The Bandera County Sheriff there says, don't panic, but the night team's John Paul Baraja spoke with people who say it's already changing the way they live. Folks are definitely on edge. I know a lot of the other moms with teenage daughters, they don't want to do anything by themselves. They're scared. I lock my doors more than I used to, and I don't think I'd be comfortable driving, walking around after dark. They need to start protecting themselves, maybe carry weapons, and don't go alone. A series of missing people has some in Bandera County taking extra precautions. The sheriff there, Daniel Butts, says he's never seen this many people vanish in such a short time frame but tells us there is no added threat to residents. I don't see where there is any evidence that we have a serial person out here attacking people. The sheriff explains the first person to disappear was Jessica Tompkins on April 30th. Authorities are still looking for her. The Bandera County Sheriff's Office tells us she was last seen at a residence near Frontier Town Loop, but a private investigator says she was last seen here at the Medina Lake Country Club wearing pink tennis shoes. This past Saturday, a search team in Lake Hills had no luck locating the 25-year-old. I didn't know the other folks, but I didn't know Jordan very, very well. Super friendly. She's a beautiful singer. The Sheriff's Office believes they found the bodies of the three other people reported missing. Investigators think Brittany McMahon's death was a suicide. Her body was found in July. Sean's Duffy's body was found in August. The sheriff says a homicide investigation continues for the 56-year-old man. People be being found the way they're being found, it just is very scary. 63-year-old Norma Espinoza was reported missing on August 12th. Bear County officials believe they found her remains September 6th, but are waiting for a positive ID and cause of death. Tonight, the sheriff hopes to fight off misinformation in his community. Don't believe everything that you hear on Facebook or read on Facebook. We go by the evidence as it's presented, and we follow that evidence to wherever it takes us. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Law enforcement already under the microscope and more scrutiny now coming to light after the response to the school shooting in Uvalde back in May. It took officers more than an hour to effectively confront the gunman. On Thursday, the Texas Department of Public Safety's director, Colonel Stephen McCraw, vowed to fire any member who did not do their job that day. It came after an internal meeting last month where McCraw was reported to say no one would be losing their jobs. Well, CNN caught up with McCraw and confronted him about that memo. Take a listen. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's correct. That's, that's correct. And you said no one is losing their jobs. No, no, I didn't say that. You're denying that you said that. I'm denying that I said that. You're denying that you said I'm that no one is losing their Victor jobs. Victor is not losing his job. Just what Victor Escalon. Yeah. McCraw said, D, said DPS Regional Director Victor Escalon will not be fired, but says he was misquoted on the possibility of other firings. Five DPS officers are being investigated for their response. Two have been suspended with pay. A brazen break in at a local car lot is turning out to be a lot more tonight. Police say that 30 year old Mark Allen McPherson is accused in at least two vehicle thefts and could be connected to more. Back in August, police say that he hot wired an RV and stole the vehicle from a Korean War veteran. That RV was just recovered this week and then today Officers say that he was behind the wheel of a stolen truck. Investigators say that several suspects rammed a gate to get into a car lot on Bandera and Broadview Drive on the city's west side. Officers say that McPherson had an ankle monitor when they arrested him. Now, we've been asking for more information about that monitor. As soon as we know, we'll pass that on to you. It's Friday night. The weather's great, and there are places in our city that have music tonight. But what's music to some is noise to others. The city of San Antonio has been trying to strike a balance between businesses and neighbors for about two years now. And now a consultant from Austin believes he has the answer. But as the night team's Patty Santos reports, it could dig into a business's bottom line. 
Juan Torres is gearing up for the sounds that liven up the St. Mary Strip every weekend. You know when we close the windows, you can still hear it. A sound expert hired by the city of San Antonio presented a final report with ideas on how to lower the noise for neighbors near entertainment venues. The 18-page report is simply a recommendation the city-appointed noise task force can consider. What's being proposed uh, by the consultant is a permitting process for businesses to have outdoor amplified sound. That permit would come at a cost to businesses. It could require businesses with amplified sound to get an agreement from neighbors that includes hours of operation and a sound impact plant. How loud they can play their sound would depend on how far away their closest neighbor is. Well, I think there'll be some work to do, some fine tuning of the language if we go that route. David Euler with the Beethoven Manicor has looked over the report and already sees unrealistic expectations for businesses like his. We've got a rock band here, or a Beethoven band. We've got a 50-piece concert band. We've got a, a big band, a swing band that plays here. And, uh, you know, it, it can get a little loud. Others think some areas are being targeted when noise problems are everywhere. It is. This is a citywide issue. This is not a St. Mary Street issue. This is not a District 1 issue. It's a District 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So let's do it all at once. The task force delayed the vote to push the recommendations to the next phase. They want to hear from businesses first. At least get their voices heard to make sure that what's going to pass here is, is amenable to their businesses. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Now for a look at your headlines in your Nightbeat News Flash. Uvalde police releasing two mugshots of two of the suspects in yesterday's shooting. 22-year-old Carlin Valdez and 17-year-old Donovan Hill. Now a third suspect who's 16 years old, is being held at a facility in Del Rio. And a fourth suspect was identified as 18-year-old Brandon Alba. Now, officers say that Alba is at a San Antonio hospital tonight. All four are accused in the gang-related shooting. We've also learned that the two victims are still recovering in hospitals in San Antonio. A carjacking case is closer now to being resolved. This right here is the last suspect that Seguin police need to find. This is Jaquez Turner. Investigators say that he was part of a group that beat up a 15-year-old before stealing his Dodge Charger. Now, Turner is from Port Arthur. Police arrested three other suspects this week. They say a 16-year-old was also involved in that carjacking, but we don't know that kid's name because they're a minor. A cross-county chase ended in a crash in San Antonio, but police say it all began in Dilly when a man robbed someone at Knife Point. From there, police say the man stole a van. Medina County authorities then chased that van down, eventually making their way into San Antonio. It was about 70 miles. Officers say the suspect then crashed into another car near Ashby and Fredericksburg Road, and that's where they arrested the suspect. And shockingly, nobody was hurt in that crash. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. Coming up tonight, more shipments of the new COVID-19 boosters are coming in. And if you roll up your sleeve, listen to this, you could get a free HEB gift card. We're going to tell you when. Plus, we're nearing the night that Manu Ginobili enters the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. Our Greg Simmons live in Massachusetts with the Spurs special. And tonight's high school football highlights. I actually think he's in Connecticut tonight. Okay. Look forward to hearing from him. Also, a home visit ends in gunfire. A man who lived there now forced from his Bear County home. We're going to tell you who else was sent to the hospital. It's next on The Night Beat. An innocent child hurt while police say a man was trying to disassemble a gun. Happened last night east of TPC Parkway in Evans, which is on the north side of the city. Bear County deputies say the victim is 11 years old and they've identified the suspect as 32-year-old Robert Gordon Stever Jr. Investigators say that he was showing someone his weapons and trying to take a gun apart when it went off. Now that child was taken to University Hospital and Stever is now booked in the Bear County Jail on a $50,000 bond. I want to give you a quick update on those new COVID booster shots. Metro Health scheduled new pop-up clinics. They're giving away AGB gift cards. Metro Health is. While the vaccine... with. You, 
Let me start over again. Get the vaccine. Cool. Get an HEB gift card for Metro Health while supplies last. The next clinic is on Thursday at Lincoln Park from 730 in the morning till 11 a.m. University Health plans to offer the new boosters on Tuesday. In both of those cases, no appointments are needed. Now, large retail pharmacies like HEB and Walgreens offer appointments online, but I don't think you can actually get an HEB card for getting the vaccine at HEB. Only Metro Health. Correct. I want to make sure people understand. That's why I got a little tongue tied there. No problem. So Metro Health, that's the way to get the free agent. Want an HEB gift card? Get your shot from Metro Health. There you go. While well, supplies speak, last. Speaking of the, that shot, what's up with that shot? All right, just a little grainy right there, a little glitchy. So that's our live cam right now at uh, Coma Lander Stadium at NEISD. And, you know, this is the kind of night where sports and weather definitely intersect because we had some storms and 12 high school football games had to be canceled tonight because of the weather. Well, postponed. Postponed, so, yes. Yeah, they pushed a little bit back because of these storms. The timing wasn't great. We had one storm there over the northeast side of town, but any of those uh, stadiums that were even nearby, even if they were underneath, underneath that storm, yeah, there were some postponements because of lightning. Let me show you some video coming out of Live Oak, and you can see there that uh, there's some heavy rain coming down. Suzanne sent this video in, and you can see how heavy the rain was uh, coming down in buckets. And we've got some estimates close to two inches in some spots uh, with this uh, heavy rain. Uh, it was good to see, but again, it, the, the timing just wasn't great when it came to uh, Friday Night Football. So let's look at some of these numbers. Windcrest 1.37 officially there. Medina Lake picked up close to an inch today. Bulverde over half an inch. Stone Oak, if you're on the east side of Stone Oak, nearly an inch there. China Grove close to an inch. Converse about half an inch. Uh, but there were some isolated spots with numbers higher than that. And uh, that uh, it was, again, very nice to see with uh, rain around the area today. Here's the situation right now. Nothing out there. Things have quieted down significantly, and that looks like we'll see a pretty quiet night. I don't expect anything to fire back up. Now, as we get into tomorrow, there will be some more opportunities for some showers and storms, much like what we saw today. Uh, we've got an upper level low off to our east. There's still a lot of dry air on the backside of it, but that hasn't been enough to keep storms from developing. And with some disturbances rolling around uh, it's north to south through our area, Still could see a few more tomorrow. Right now, 78 degrees, mostly cloudy. Dew point is at 71. Some places are still in the 80s at this hour. 80 in Hondo, 80 in Pleasanton, and then low 80s as you get down to Port SA and down around Stinson. Here's our forecast. Uh, again, we don't expect anything tonight or into tomorrow morning, but it's by the afternoon where we'll see more of these random pop-ups. And if you do get underneath one, you could pick up some good rain, maybe some lightning and thunder. Your case at 12 hour forecast. Morning soccer games tomorrow look good. Temperatures will be in the mid 70s and then we'll quickly warm up 81 degrees by 10 o'clock. And then again, we make it into the 90s for highs tomorrow. And then down the line, here's what we're watching. These are dew points. So this is the humidity. It'll still be humid tomorrow and I think part of Sunday. But by Sunday afternoon, some drier air works in with a weak frontal boundary drops dew points. And that'll be the case Sunday evening and into Monday morning. In turn, we'll see some cooler mornings ahead. I think by Monday morning, we could be talking about 60s here in San Antonio, believe it or not. Uh, and low temperatures, maybe around 70 on Tuesday. So it'll feel a little bit better. Uh, here's the extended forecast. Ozone action day tomorrow, by the way, 94, 10% chance of rain. Lower humidity Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, but still hot afternoons. And then we add in some rain chances by late next week. We'll take the lower humidity, Justin. It'll feel nice. Yes, thank you. Yep. All right, let's head out to the East Coast where my new Ginobili is about to get the big honor. I think he actually got his coat tonight. Greg Simmons joined us live from yeah. Connecticut. Greg. Yeah, it, it was just a special night because it involved his family, his three little boys this evening. And what did he have to say before his call to the hall? We got that for you when we come back. Also, Mother Nature playing a huge role in tonight's big game coverage with numerous lightning delays coming up. Good evening, everyone, and welcome live to Mohegan Sun Casino in Connecticut. The night before, Manu Ginobili is inducted into Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. But before that can happen, his first official duty as part of the enshrinement occurred this afternoon. I'm thrilled to be here for him and most importantly to have been a teammate of his. From former teammates to current Hall of Famers, Manu Ginobili belongs with the pro basketball elite. Tenacity. Yeah, he played uh, always 100%. I can always see him driving, thriving, trying to get to the hoop. 
His passion and love for the game is what has also attracted him to fans from all over the world. In fact, that's one of the questions Manu was asked today. Where does that tenacity come from? I noticed it very early on. I never looked for it. I didn't choose it. I didn't practice it. It was ingra ingrained somewhere. I don't know if it's in genes or something happened with, in, in my family that I got impregnated with that uh, craziness. Manu is also the first player from Argentina to suit up in the NBA. A very unlikely uh, outcome for a kid born where I was born, but super uh, grateful of every single person and team along the way. Before enshrinement, the hardware and jackets had to be passed down. And look who delivered my news. His sons, Dante, Nico, and Luca. What a moment. It sure was. Now we're going to take it live from Connecticut back to San Antonio for our big game coverage and Larry Ramirez. start with a big matchup between number five Harlan and number two Brennan in a District 29-6A opener for both. The Bears bite first. Ashton Dubose standing tall in the pocket finds a wide open Avron Carter who strolls into the end zone 33 yards and it is 7-0 Bears. Ah, but the Hawks strike back. Running back Jacob Gonzalez takes the handoff, follows his blockers, gets to the corner of the end zone, tying this at seven, but it was all Bears after that. Running back Jason Love starts up the middle, finds a seam and goes untouched 17 yards to the house, 14-7 Bears. Then just before the half, Dubose rolls out and lobs it to his brother Aaron Dubose in the end zone for the 20-yard touchdown. It was 27-7, Brennan at the half, and Brennan rolls 48-10. to You know, obviously it's a big game. First game of district, Harlan's 2-0, so, you know, big challenge for our team. Their coach, my coach, Ellis, does a great job and, you know, started a little slow. I hope we stop doing that, but I think we got into our groove in the first half. Kind of same thing in the second half, got into our groove later in the game, but uh, generally plays with how we played. Still got a coach him up and execute at a higher level, but overall good performance. Take it East Central where the Hornets were hosting the Smithson Valley Rangers. First quarter, Rangers on the EC30. Chase Sinelik goes to Kyler Clark on the hot route and check out the quick feed. A Clark, he spins out of a tackle and he turns on the Jets. The 30-yard score makes it 7 to nothing. Rangers and right now Smithson Valley leads that one 38 to 7 in the third. Time for some 28-6A football between the Madison Mavericks and Churchill Chargers. Madison down 3 nothing, but they take the lead right here. Landon Gill to Jordan Clay who makes a lead Leaping grab. Now the defender falls down and Clay is off to the races. 58 yard touchdown puts Madison on top 7 to 3. And it's still in the first half because of all the lightning in the area. And here is your score update Madison leads Churchill 7 to 6 in the second quarter, staying in District 28 6A. Lee and Roosevelt at Comalander Stadium. And weather was a factor again because this one was delayed by over two hours due to lightning. And when they finally got the all clear, Roosevelt went on the attack. Quarterback Brian Roeder steps up in the pocket and he's going to dump it off to Dylan Coleman who picks up some great downfield blocking to spring him loose on a 65 yard touchdown. It was seven to nothing Roosevelt when we left. Look at that man go. Let's go to the big game covered scoreboard right now and Roosevelt leads Lee 14 to seven. Again Madison over Churchill seven to six right now in the second quarter. You have Brennan beating Harlan 48 to 10 and Smithson Valley over East Central 38 to seven. Number eight Alamo Heights played Highlands at Alamo Stadium. The Mules kick hard on the first offensive snap of the game. Running back Michael Terry the third takes the handoff, finds a hole, cuts it up the middle, makes one defender miss, and he's off to the races. 63-yard touchdown, 7 to nothing. Alamo Heights. And then this District 14 5 2 matchup was delayed by what else? Lightning. Let's check out the score. Alamo Heights is up 28-9 at halftime. Edison faced off with McCollum at Harlandell Memorial Stadium in District 14 5 2 The Cowboys up 21-0 when we arrive, and they add to that lead. Justin Rodriguez fired over the middle to a wide open Steven Medina who gets behind the defense for a 30 yard score 28 nothing at that point and McCollum gets the dub 28 to 7. Staying with District 14 5A2 we have Harlandale and Lanier from the SAISD Sports Complex. Harlandale up 21 zip when quarterback Jacob Saucedo takes the snap steps out of the pocket and he goes deep to Pedro Valenzuela who gets tackled at the two yard line so close. Harlandale will punch it in from 
there. Saucedo takes it himself. Let's head back to the scoreboard. And Harlandale is up 35-0 on Lanier at halftime. McCollum beats Edison by a final of 28-7. And in two more scores, we have Alamo Heights up at half, 28-9. And Laredo Cigarroa is up 35-7 on South Sound. Actually, that game has gone final. Back to the action now. We have Cedar Park Vista Ridge at Lenoff Stadium to face Clemens. First quarter, Clemens on the move. Nathan Alvarez pump fakes, then goes to the end zone to Paul Minky for a leaping grab over the defender for a touchdown. The 15-yard score made it 7-0 Clemens, and Clemens is trailing right now 21-13 in the fourth quarter. Up next, we have MacArthur and Veterans Memorial from Rutledge Stadium. First quarter, James Peoples comes in motion for the handoff. He finds a gap to get to the open field, and he is sprinting down the sideline all the way to Pater. 92-yard run makes it 7 to nothing Patriots, and right now that score is Veterans Memorial is up 41-0 at halftime. More non-district football now between Bandera and Kennedy. Bandera up 9-0 in the third, looking for more. Jesus Cardenas takes the handoff, and it looks like he's going to be brought down, but he keeps his balance, spins out of the pile, and breaks free for a 50-yard score. They go for two and get it to make it 17 nothing. and it looks like that game has gone final. Bandera wins it 24-14. to Austin St. Michael's was scheduled to face Central Catholic and Bob Benson 66 Stadium. The game was scheduled to kick at 7 p.m., but after a lengthy weather delay, it was canceled around 9.15 tonight with no rescheduled date set for this non-district matchup. Let's head back to the scoreboard now for some more scores. There you have that game was canceled between Central Catholic and Austin St. Michael's. Bandera wins it 24-14. to And two more scores, we have Cedar Park Vista Ridge over Clemens 21-13 in the fourth, and Veterans Memorial is up big on MacArthur 41-0 at halftime. Up next, our big game coverage road trip with more highlights and more scores. But first, let's listen to the Marshall Rams marching band. Our big game coverage road trip has Andrew and photographer Eddie Latigo headed west with stops in Dehennis, Hondo, and Castroville. With more, let's take you live to Panther Country, and that's where we find our Andrew Seeley. Thanks a lot, Larry. And you'd love this road trip. Eddie and I were in the Storm Chaser tonight, and the sky was crystal clear for all three of our games along Highway 90. Our road trip began with a game in Dehennis with the Cowboys hosting Junction. Rare Friday night kickoff at Butch Bowl Stadium. After the visiting Eagles march down the field on the opening drive, DeHennis trails 6-0 midway through the first quarter. That is until Jaime Rodriguez steps in front of the receiver for the interception. DeHennis takes over in plus territory, and they capitalize. On the ensuing drive, quarterback Dalen Gonzalez lobs it up to Colton Dalton in the end zone for the touchdown. Extra point is good, and DeHennis leads 7-6. Say hello to the fans over at Barry Field. Hondo hosting Brackett, early second quarter, game tied at 14 all, and the Owls offense is red hot. Quarterback Ryan Gilliam goes deep for Brandon Hasso, who goes up and gets it one foot in bounds. That's a 25 yard touchdown, and Hondo takes a 21 14 lead. Last stop of the road trip is in Medina Valley. Panthers taking on Southwest Legacy. Home team already up 14 7 early in the third quarter, and they have a simple plan. Hand off to running back Anthony Guerrero and let him do the rest. He cuts back against the grain, steps out of a tackle, and nearly takes this the distance. 62 yards that sets up first and goal at the seven-yard line, and the Panthers punch it in on fourth and goal a few plays later. Guerrero for the one-yard score, and Medina Valley goes up 21-7. to Let's head now to the big game coverage scoreboard for that final and more. DeHennis beats Junction 21-6. to Hondo falls to Bracket in a shootout 51-49, to and Southwest Legacy rallies to beat Medina Valley 34-21. to Guys, the Titans scored 27 unanswered points in the fourth quarter to do it. They played so well, the lights went out in the stadium at the final horn. That's truly a lights-out comeback. Larry, back to you. All right, thanks, Andrew. We have one more scoreboard, I believe, for you out there. Barty Champion beats Canyon Lake 44-36, and number one Steel leads Hutto 49-16 in the fourth quarter. Guys, crazy night due to lightning. Lots of stuff going on and still going on. And still going on, yeah. yes. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> we'll be right back in two minutes. It's Friday. Have a great weekend, everybody. You've earned a wonderful weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Good night.